Swinburne University of Technology. I'm Professor Josie Arnold and today I'm talking to Dr. Mark Shear about a scientific PhD. Mark is a senior lecturer in the Faculty of Health Sciences and he has research and teaching and PhD supervision in such areas as sensory neuroscience, vision, attention and driving performance simulation. So there you go, plenty of things to talk about in relationship to the science PhD. So Mark, the science PhD, is, is there a particular way you think about that when you're talking to your prospective students? Uh, it's, it's hard to say really, Josie. It's, it's more like it's really the, the model of the PhD that I, that I know well and it's you know, an experimental model. So students read and they think about the topic and exploring the topic and then they design an experiment to effectively test some hypotheses or you know, make some findings of that and then review that in light of the other findings and you know, make some conclusions and so, so it's, I suppose it's really the, the type of thing that I don't even think about. Mm, yeah. mm. So it's a very traditional model that your students are probably aware of from an honours course, do you think? Yes, or they come into it from there? Yeah, that that's would be the typical model to come in from an honours course. And even the sort of training that they get in basic science is really set up along that you know, experimental report model. So the lab reports that they'd write in their undergraduate things are really modelled along the same thing. So, you know, some background, some hypotheses perhaps, some experimental work, you know, method experimental work, and then the findings and discussion. And, you know, that's, if you like, expand that out by a factor of 10 for a, for a PhD thesis with more involved findings and some original work, of course. And so do they generally bring their work from their um, honours year into their PhD or do they start a whole new project or is it a mixture of It's this? a bit of a mixture. The ones, the ideal ones would probably bring, bring something that would extend their honours thesis work or their honours research work. So they may have done, for example, a smaller, a pilot study for something that, you know, looked like it was interesting. And then, of course, you know, without the sort of participant numbers or, you know, experimental, uh, the, the sort of the right number of people recording from, because most of my sort of projects are really about the, you know, recording from people, electrical mm -hmm. activity from people, for example. Uh, without a reasonable participant pool number, then the findings might be indicative from their honours year, and then you extend them and sort of bolster the you know the significance of those with the PhD. So that would be one way. Another way would be students who have a sort of a basic background in in those discipline areas, you know, for example psychology or biomedical science or physiology or something like that where they've got a, an understanding of the, the basics in that and then really looking for a project to sort of you know extend themselves in that in that area and make some new findings. And can those projects or do those projects come from industry or not? Uh, some of them do. Uh, typically they might be you know I suppose you know without blowing your own trumpet but they might be things that I'm interested in of course and there might be things that I've negotiated with the students where they're interested in something that's a little bit further this way and me this way and we've sort of come to an area where I'm comfortable with supervising the project you know with my level of experience and, and background in that area. I don't want to deviate too far from that because I don't want to feel like I'm supervising students who are you know a bit outside my area where I wouldn't be able to give them the supervision that they need. And so does this research go to industry or does is it pure research that sits there until it's needed or does it add to other research Look, it's knowledge? A, it's, a, it's a bit of a mixture. Some of it is very applied. So, you know, I was uh, associated with a cooperative research centre a few years back and so we were looking at the types of things that might give rise to an understanding of attention and that's got a, an immediate application to people you know perhaps attending to the situation where they're driving a car in heavy traffic or the middle of the night or something like that so how do you monitor those things and so you know the types of recordings the types of things that we did there gave a, a bit of a lens into that that could have an you know a fairly 
uh, uh, soon application, and you know they're already looking at you know in car based technology to monitor driver drowsiness and attentional behaviour and that sort of thing. So it's feeding into that area. Some of it might be a bit more uh, further away from getting anywhere, so it's just building that knowledge base in an area. For example, I've just uh, co-supervising a student that's going to be looking at uh, one of the ways that the brain functions, in particular some some waves that come from deep within the brain that we're going to examine with uh, the MEG and things to look at, see how they feed into sleep-related behaviour and how they might feed, uh, how they might be related to some states where there are disorders of sleep. And so. Clearly these are fascinating topics and your students are clearly very happy to work with you on these if, if they come from your study. Yeah. And um, also of course as you say they might come from outside. So do you have to have uh, big laboratories or how does that operate? It, it sort of depends on the project a bit. Some, some of them are, are quite, I suppose, more theoretically based or they might be computationally based, so your students are simulating behaviour in the brain or in the nervous system. Others of them you know, might be related to recording from people and you know, we obviously need space where we can put electrodes on people and sit them up or lie them down or whatever we need to do. And some of them, I think the, one of the ones I mentioned there, the, the sort of deep brain structures you know, require something like the MRI or the, the MEG. So you know, that's a big, that's big investment thing, but the university already has that sort of, you know, those facilities. And the MRI is? The magnetic resonance imaging machine. And that shows you? That shows you sort of structural and some functional aspects of what's going on in the brain. So we've learned a lot, or you in particular, but it's been conveyed even to people like myself, about how the brain operates because of this technology. That's right. And, and in some cases, you don't, you don't, um, it's not warranted to use that sort of technology. It's sort of like, do we need a really big hammer if we've got a fine problem? It's, probably better to you know to use a different technique and so some of the things have been a combination of you know perhaps eye movement recording and uh, and behavioral parameters how well people uh, can detect between different stimuli and things like that so you know, it's a bit of a mixture and clearly as you're working with human subjects ethics ethics yes that tends to be one of the slower processes in the in the system you can do the experiments fairly quickly but you know, the ethics approval does take time. In most cases, it's, it's often straightforward because they're safe techniques. Yes. The recording from the brain and the MRI and so forth are, are techniques that the ethics, approve, uh, the ethics committees have already approved. And so they're just cross-checking to make sure that standard protocols are being followed that have already been approved. But for things that are a bit new or a little different, you know, they, they want a bit more mm. information. So sometimes that means a couple of uh, interactions with the ethics committee to make them understand what it is that you're trying to achieve. Mark, one of the great things for me supervising is what I learn. Do you find that? Absolutely. Uh, I, I think the, uh, the students all come with their own sort of kit bag of skills and experiences and they're all different. And so, you know, different personalities have a different way of approaching and tackling problems. And you think, wow, sometimes, you know, that's a great way of looking at, uh, at that issue. And I'll remember to sort of, you know, think a little bit differently uh, next time. So, yeah, I, and I've certainly learnt, learnt things. And even, you know, by the time you get to the end of the project, you know, it's often said that the the graduating or the finishing PhD will know more than their supervisor in a particular area and I think that's it's ultimately you know that's spot on. Yes I think they become the world expert yeah, in, the, yes. in whatever you launch them yes, into. Yeah yeah and so they've sort of you know they've uh, piggybacked along the way from your knowledge and their experience and their own knowledge and they've extended it that you know that bit further and that and that's an, that to me is an exciting part seeing the finished thesis and you know, seeing them uh, graduate and those sorts of things, uh, you know, that's really the icing on the cake for me. And where do your students go 
when they've finished their PhD? Look, it, I suppose it depends. You know, some of them have been international students. So, you know, one one in particular went back to Sri Lanka to a university back there. So now he's now an assistant professor in electrical oh, engineering there, yeah. and another of them uh, was headhunted by a sort of a, a company that was interested in the work that she'd done on three, 3D three audio or sort of st stereo audio sounds and so she worked for a while in one company and somebody else found out about her and so they poached her from there and so you know she's she's you know done fantastic work and you know and others of them are, are back in education or in research institutes or you know sort of around the place so it, it's sort of interesting to see where they've gone. <coughs> Excuse me. Neuroplasticity has become very big with Norman Doig. What do you think about that? Look, it's not my area, but uh, look, I think you know from from the what I, what I do know about it is I think that um, uh, learning is good for neural for neuroplasticity, and so we all should keep trying to learn. Keep doing PhDs, keep, more keep, PhDs. Keep doing PhDs and more PhDs and. <coughs> <laughs> Supervising students, I think, as you said earlier, is a, is a great way to learn. You do learn, yes. you do learn a lot from that. So I think, you know, the pursuit of knowledge, whether it's for the benefit of yourself or the benefit of society, or it's got an immediate application, I think that's, you know, that it's a win-win for everybody. I think. And how did you get into this kind of area? Oh, look, probably the same as most people. It just, it just happened. You know, I, I remember when I was at when I was at high school. I, you know, it was less common for people to go into university. Yeah, a bit common, but less common. And my uh, year twelve physics teacher said, "Mark, watch out for that education merry-go-round because once you get on, <laughs> you can't get <laughs> off." <laughs> and so, yes, I, you know, I did a bachelor's degree and then I did a master's degree and then I did a PhD and you know I sort of worked to support the PhD part time and you know and things have just gone on from there I've got a position and another one and yes and how do you talk to your PhD students do you see them regularly or do you work with them or it it depends a little bit on the student but I mean I try I definitely try and see them regularly and it you know meet, meeting with them regularly I think make sure that you know, even if you're not reviewing data or you're not reviewing the work, just having that, you know, the conversation, I think, and, you know, making sure that they feel like they belong somewhere, I think, is just as important sometimes as, you know, the pursuit of the, uh, of the project or the plan. Um, I, did have a, I did have a master's student a while back who was uh, overseas, so that was interesting sort mm. of supervising her while she was in, uh, she was in the Netherlands. And so it was, you know, quite tricky. We had Skype yes. conversations, and we did a lot of Dropbox dropping of documents, and you know, things like that. So it was, but it, look, it, it was quite rewarding because, and I think, I think it worked well because she was exceptionally motivated. She really wanted to, you know, she had the goal in sight there, and she really wanted to, uh, to finish this off, and she finished it off under time. So you know, that was. <laughs> And that so you would good. recommend that, of course, to your PhD students. They work backwards from when they'd like to submit the kind of work yeah, they have to yeah. do. And I think one of the one of the traps with them is, and I and I remember this for myself as well, is that you're struggling along, and it's such a long journey that's mapped out in front of you, and you think, "Am I making any progress?" Yes. And so sometimes I spend my time when I do connect with the students or you know meet with them regularly, saying. Yes, look, but look at what you've achieved. They're going, oh, I don't feel like I've done anything yet. Yeah, but you've done this. You put an ethics application. You've done this. You've recruited this. You know, you can list off the things that then they go, oh, wow, I yes, have done yes. some things. So I think them having their own sort of personal milestones that they can tick off and you're is a good thing. Them. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And look, I'm a list person anyway. So, you know, <laughs> if, they, if they learn something from me that, you know, lists can be useful in the right hands, but... You know, maybe they're not a list person, so you have to you have to go with the flow a bit as well. And of course, science comes from a strongly Enlightenment background, which has dominated Western knowledge models. Do you have students who can 
perhaps use a narrative discourse? Is that something that you've moved to yet or Looks, inclined to or look, opposed to? Possibly. No, I'm not, I'm not opposed to it. I think it's, it's, harder to get into, it's harder to get into the sort of exploratory sciences. But look, I, I don't supervise any students in that area, but I'm, but I'm also a sort of a keen scholar of teaching and learning. And of course, you know, the narrative voice in that's very important because, you know, you have to observe and you have to sort of uh, interpret and infer rather than sort of, well, I suppose it's observing, interpreting, and inferring as well in science, but it, but it tends to be much more, here's, here's my hypothesis and I'm going to test that. Whereas, you know, the, the narrative, more discursive style, I think is really about, there's a whole lot of information out here and I want to try and get that into a, you know, get that into a shape. So I suppose, yeah, look, it's an interesting question, Josie. I think the, I think the answer to it is they probably already do some of it anyway, particularly in getting their own voice into the literature mm, mm. review, because we don't want a list of papers with years after them and, and no story weaving them together. We yes. really want them to tell their understanding of it. So I suppose it's already in there in some respect. But in terms of the, you know, the sort of alternative thesis models, I'm not sure how they might work in science. Although I think there are some people exploring the sort of uh, artifact and exegesis type thing, particularly when you're creating something like a new piece of equipment or mm. those sorts of things. I think might lend itself more to that style. Science itself is very exciting, though, isn't it? I mean, you know, I can remember having a student who said we. Uh, put a light to a Bunsen burner and it burnt. It was the most exciting thing in about year eight. So students are excited by science. Students are excited by science. And I, and I think if you've been excited by science, then you, know, you probably are a scientist at heart. So I think if you find it, scientific things and the discovery of new things and an appreciation of our understanding of those things exciting, then probably you know, you've got some scientific um, background or motivation in you. But look, I'm, I never fail to be surprised by what happens. Of course, saying that, it's not all like any area. It's not always, you know, glittery things. No. There's a lot of hard work and perspiration along the way. Yeah. And a lot of um, peers who are evaluating you, which is, of course, true of all PhD yes. studies, they must sit well within the peer yes. evaluations. Yeah. Would you like briefly to talk about the peer evaluation? Yeah. Of the thesis or of the work? Well, or? just generally how that affects the literature review, the thesis, how you okay. feel about... Yeah, look, it's, it's, an interesting, it's an interesting area and it's come under a bit more scrutiny late, lately, but I think, I think the idea of you know, peer review of, of what you're doing um, it's not necessarily the most perfect way to judge whether the science is good or not, because I think some things can slip through that didn't look like they're going to meet the crowd's estimates of what should be going on. But by and large, I think the feedback that you get from peer review probably means uh, your work's been understood and uh, somebody's offering some suggestions to clarify a few things or help you sharpen some points. And, and that's typically what comes back with a, with a review. You need to fix up this area, we don't understand this. Or it comes back saying, what does this mean? We've got, we don't <laughs> get any of it. Yes. Which is good feedback too, because it means that you've either pitched it at the wrong level and you, know, you perhaps assumed the reader had too much knowledge in that area. And so you really should write it for the introduction at least before you step into the heavy duty science. So I think... I think the peer review process is good. Um, of course, there's a cost with that, and that means that, you know, like other people, you end up with emails in your inbox saying, can you review this paper, right. or can you <laughs> review this thing for a conference, or yes. can you review this one yet again, because yes. the authors have made some corrections and we want some more sort of feedback on that. So that's the kind of collegiality, too, that underpins the PhD, doesn't it? Because not only do you have to have the literature review and look at what's going on in your subject area, but um, also you have to have examiners who will be able to look at what's happened. Yes. And so I suppose you have in the sciences a very particular view of who the examiners might be. 
Well, I think it depends on the topic. Yes. I think it's really a, a matter of looking carefully. And I suppose we're getting used to that now because more journals are asking when you submit a paper, more journals are now asking for a list of three people who could review your article. That's right, yeah. And so, you know, we're getting used to that model. And so typically you, you might look at who's well published in that area, who's respected in that area to review a student's PhD thesis because obviously I mean you probably could get anybody to review it but you know the feedback that you get then is going to be less critical and less useful for the student to learn yes, from yes. and so I think it's worthwhile getting a getting good examiners for students PhDs because you know then it's opened their work up to the world if they haven't got many publications during their PhD and it's also uh, given the examiner a view into your laboratory, you know, oh, that work's going on there. Oh, wow. Right. So yes. I, I think there's, you know, there's some benefits for that. And as much as we niggle because the, you know, the request to review things and to review theses and examine theses and review papers all come at seemingly the most inappropriate times, <laughs> um, I'm not actually sure that there is an appropriate time for when they could turn up. <laughs> Mark, you obviously love your work and you're obviously a very um, enthusiastic scientist. Do you think that influences your PhD students to be more positive about their work? I think so and I, I suppose I'm, I'm generally optimistic and I, and if one, one thing that I do like to do is you know really make sure that the student feels like whatever they're doing is valuable. Mm. You know, I like to encourage them positive feedback much more than negative feedback and of course you know sometimes you can't avoid yes. having a sit down and a you know a sort of a thorough talk to a student occasionally but most of the time it's you know that's good and this is good and what about trying this and you know yeah well we've had a setback with the ethics committee how do we you know how do we go about addressing their concerns or you know what about rephrasing this because the the experimental results aren't any good can we do something else with the same participants and you know get some more data you know, can we yes yeah, and so, so how do you address completion in the shortest amount of time uh, it's look, very confusing for my students because they get four years from the university and then they're told to do it in three years and they're never yes. going to do it in three years if they've got a little bit of paper saying you've got, yeah, four, got four years, years yes I think the I mean I think it's um you know it's appealing to their look you, you can do the good work in three years yes. And you it know, does keep it fresh, doesn't it? It keeps it fresh. It means that, you know, you, you, you're perhaps working a bit, you're working a little bit harder, not too much harder, I don't think. You're working a bit harder and you're sort of uh, doing it a bit more consistently. Mm. So you're not having long breaks where you're stepping away, which sometimes tends to happen with, you know, other things. And I think it's harder for part-time students yes. or students who yes. are busy with families or things like that to keep a focus on it. And it's harder if you come back, doesn't isn't it? Because it's, you have to go further back to come forward You have to go again. further back, yes. Yeah. Well, I, Mark, it's been really wonderful speaking with you and I'm sure that uh, science students under your supervision are extremely fortunate and I look forward to their going forward and to your going forward with them. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Josie. This has been a Swinburne production. 